Well, hey, greetings, Riverside. Uh, Pastor Ezra here, excited to uh, continue in our Justice, Kindness, and Humility uh, series. I got the t-shirt on. I'm ready to go. Uh, really, today's message is a continuation in some ways of last week's uh, message. We looked at the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of James. Today, we're going to be jumping over into chapter 3 and also looking uh, at part of First Peter as well. Uh, but the idea for today and the big picture that we're trying to grab a hold of is this idea of, of the need that we have for wisdom. Man, we live in an age and a time where wisdom is desperately needed. I was, I was in some conversations this week and we were talking about how they've described the age that we're in as the information age. And in a lot of ways that's true. There's unlimited information that is available to us. There's almost no question that you could ask or think of that, that you couldn't jump on uh, to a computer and find an answer to. But the question is that, that we've now arrived at is, is that information accurate? <laughs> We can get information, uh, but, but can we trust the information that we're getting? Uh, can we trust the source of the information? And so in some ways we move from the age of information into the age of disinformation, the age of, of confusion. And so we've come full circle back around to the point where, where Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate looked at Jesus and he said, what is truth? And some of us are doing that today where we're like, man, I don't even know if I can believe what truth is. But, but wisdom, what wisdom does is wisdom looks at information it's able to discern what is trustworthy and what is not, and then it's able to take wise action based on that information. Uh, as, as you well know, just having the information uh, doesn't make you wise. And in fact, sometimes if you know the information and you fail to act on it, that's negligence, right? And so wisdom is taking the right action in response to the information uh, that you have. And man, we need wise leaders. We need to be wise as individuals. Uh, we need to, you need to be wise in whatever position God has placed you, in whatever position of influence and leadership you have, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your workplace, uh, whether it's in a larger group or, or in the community, uh, that you need to operate with godly wisdom. And, and sadly, when we look around us at the world, uh, there, there seems to be a real void. There seems to be a real lack of people who are operating in godly wisdom. And so today, this is gonna really be an exploration of what does it mean to be wise? Uh, how do we know and how do we identify what godly wisdom looks like? And, and how do we pursue it in our own lives? How do we evaluate the way that we're thinking about things and the way that we've been motivated? And, and how do we put it up against scripture and say, hey, this is what I've been doing, but is this what God wants? Is this in line with his way of wisdom, because his wisdom is the only wisdom that will last, the only wisdom that matters, the only wisdom that really uh, will, will lead us to the place that we ultimately want to go. So uh, join me in prayer, and I'm excited to jump in uh, to James chapter 3. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the chance to open up your word. It is a gift to us. It is a treasure trove of, of your wisdom that you've given to us. You are a God who, who loves us, who's almighty and all-powerful. Uh, and you want to be known by your creation. We, we, you want your, uh, your creation to know you and to come into a deeper relationship with you. And that's why you gave us your word. And so I thank you that we have it. It's a, it's, it's a powerful gift. And I pray that as we read it today, uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds to understand and receive all that you are saying to us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, and so, uh, so we're really going to look at four, uh, four sort of uh, truths about wisdom, uh, four facts about wisdom is, is how we're going to structure the sermon today. And so the first one that we're going to look at is that a wise person seeks to control their tongue. A wise person will seek to control and to tame uh, their tongue. Uh, we got a little bit of preview of this last week in James chapter 2, and now we're going to look at it in more depth today. And, and so we pick up in James chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. 
So also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of such great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Man, James, uh, he doesn't mince words when it comes to the tongue, and, uh, and he says some really strong and, and harsh things, but, uh, but my imagination is that as, as you were hearing that, in the same way that as, as I was reading it, uh, that, that it strikes us to the heart. We, we think about, man, there's been some times where I've tried to pour salt water and fresh water from the same spring, that, that there's been times when my tongue has gotten the better of me. There's been times when, when I failed to tame my tongue and I've paid the consequences uh, for that. And, and essentially he says this, we know that there's no one sinless. Jesus is the only sinless person who has ever lived. Uh, and, uh, but it's interesting what James says here is that if you can control your tongue, you could actually be sinless. If we're going to sin, one of the first places we're going to do it is with our tongue, with our mouth. We're going to say some things, and that is going to uh, just light this whole forest fire of, of, of pain into our lives. In fact, he uses that analogy, and I know uh, for, for many of us, we saw last year the wildfires in Australia and, and just the devastation and, and the way that it just wrecked people's lives. And, and here in our country on the West Coast, uh, just this year, we've seen uh, the wildfires in California and Oregon and Washington, and, and um, man, just... Uh, pictures that look like something out of a science fiction movie. It's hard to believe people uh, escaping the flames. And, and what he says is, you know, each one of those fires was, was started by a small spark. It might have been a lightning strike that hit one tree. Uh, it might have been a, a transformer that, that exploded. I'm not talking about Autobots and Decepticons here, right? I'm talking about transformers on the wires, right? But, but you know, it, it shoots off a spark. It might have been someone carelessly not putting out a fire, but whatever it was, there was, you know, millions of acres of forest burned by, by a single spark that began the fire. And the same thing is true with our tongues. We say something and we don't have control of, of all of the outcome of what comes out of it. We've seen this in our, in our society, right? That, uh, that people have said things and because of one phrase, one word, one sentence that they spoke, they lost their job, they lost their reputation, uh, they, they, they lost everything. Uh, and, and, and sometimes it was because, man, they had something inside of them, right? They had a, 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 an evil thought, uh, they had a, a prejudice or a discriminatory idea or, or, or a racist thought or, or a sexist thought, right? They had, they had some, some sort of idea, but they, they were filtering it so it wasn't coming out of their mouth. And then in a, in, a, in, a, in a vulnerable moment, they actually let it spill forth. And when that ugliness was revealed, um, everything was lost. And, and sometimes rightfully so, right? But, um, but, but, but it comes down to the, the tongue is kind of the gateway. If you, if you keep your mouth shut, Proverbs talks about this, right? That a, a fool who keeps his mouth uh, silent is deemed as wise. That, uh, that uh, sometimes if we keep our mouths shut, uh, we can appear wise. Uh, but when we start where, where words are many, sin is not absent. And, and so the tongue, and he says the tongue is set on fire by hell, right? With it we bless God and we curse those who are made in his image and it shouldn't be that way. Uh, maybe like me you have some regrets about things that you've said. Maybe today, maybe this week, maybe this month, maybe as you think back in your history, um, maybe taming the tongue is a, a significant issue for you and, and maybe the problem as we looked at last week is that if you're not quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, uh, that anger erupts. And sometimes you say the, these wicked things that are down inside of you. Sometimes you say things that you don't even really mean, but in the heat of the moment, you just say it and you wish you could take it back, but you, can, but you can't. Uh, but a wise person will begin to understand how to tame their tongue. I remember one time I was, uh, I was just out of college and I was hanging out with some friends of mine. Uh, we were all into music and 
Uh, so we went over to a guy's house we'd never met. He was having a party. We went over there. Supposedly he was a pretty good guitar player. I never actually met the guy over the course of the evening, but at one point I was sitting in one room and the next room over I could hear uh, someone playing the guitar and, and I could hear him and he was playing the song Alive by Pearl Jam. Uh, but wasn't doing a very good job of it. I mean, it was it was sloppy. It did. It was it, he was struggling with it. And I remember thinking in the moment, like, oh man, I guess this guy's not really that good uh, at guitar, uh, like they had said. And so the night went on, and uh, we went to leave. I was sitting in the back seat of, of the car with my buddy as we were driving home, and he's like, hey, what'd you think about that guy? You know, did you get to hear him play guitar? And I was like, yeah, you know what? I was sitting in the room next. Uh, I didn't hear him, but. I didn't get to see it, but I was sitting next door and I could hear in the next room he was trying to play live and man, he was bad. It was it was like not good. That, I don't think he's very good at all. And my buddy looked at me and he's like, uh, that was me. <laughs> and in that moment I was like, uh, I wanna I wanna pull the words back in and I'm i I'm sitting there like looking in his face and I can't play it off. I can't uh trick him anything like, yeah, I was just messing around, man. You were good. I just had to sit there in it and uh, I felt horrible and because I knew that my words had damage on on him and, and here's the reality at that point I had just started learning to play guitar myself I was certainly a worse guitar player than he was at that point uh, but what I was doing is by by criticizing this guy who was supposed to be good I was kind of bringing him down a notch so I could bring myself up a notch and that's what we do we use our words to try and cut people down so that in essence, our, our goal is to elevate ourselves, and that, and that leads us really well into James' next statement on wisdom, that, that a wise person has the right motivation. In that moment, my motivation was selfish. My motivation was like, well, I want to feel better about myself, so I'll knock this guy down a few steps, so I'm, I'm a little bit closer to, to overtaking him. I elevate my status. And uh, man, that is not the way that we should be motivated to, to think or to speak towards others. And so let's look at what James says um, in verse 13. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Man, um, he, he spoke earlier in this chapter and said, not many of you should seek to be leaders. Part of the problem is that there were a bunch of people that he was writing to that they're like, hey, I want to be a leader in the church. I want to get up and teach. I want to be a preacher. I want to I want to tell other people. And he said, hey, pump the brakes on that. Listen, if you are a teacher, then you're going to be held to a higher standard to a higher account and then he reiterates that here in verse 13 he says if you think that you're wise and understanding then you should demonstrate it uh, with your your good works uh, with the meekness of wisdom but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition if that's your goal if if the reason you want to preach and teach is because you want people to look at you and and other, that's that's out of jealousy you're jealous of someone else's gift or that's out of ambition you want to elevate yourself and, and a wise person will not be motivated by self-interest. In fact, the, the question is, when we come to any decision, instead of saying, is it best for me, we should say, is it best for us? A wise person will say, hey, how's this gonna impact everyone? And even if it, it hurts me a little bit, but if the overall value is, is better for our community, then the wise thing to do is to choose what benefits us all. I mean, that's this is uh, elections boiled down in a nutshell, right? Like if every, uh, American was saying, hey, for our country, for our state, for my local community, our school board, if, if I don't go in and say, hey, what's going to get me ahead? This guy promised to give me the world, so I'm just going to vote for him. If instead we say, hey, what's best for the community? Uh, you know, are, are, uh, is, there, is there a politician, is there an elected official who's come up with a plan that will actually raise our whole community? Because when the whole community rises, we all benefit from it ultimately. Uh, but but if I'm just selfishly saying, well, this guy promised he would he would give me this program, or he would cut my taxes, or he would do whatever, or she, or or whoever the case may be, if we're doing it selfishly, we end up pretty much where we are today, where with a, with a divided nation, where everyone is for the most part just trying to say, well, hey, I'm I'm just trying to do what's best for me and my family. Uh, man, that's that's not where wisdom comes from. Uh, the wisdom says, is it best for us? Uh, he says that jealousy and, and selfishness ultimately resort in disorder in every vile practice. And it just makes sense, right? When everyone is trying to do what's better for them, if everyone's saying, hey, well, I want what's going to get me ahead, 
uh, then, then obviously it's going to lead to disorder because we're not all going in the same direction together. We're going in 20 different directions or 20 million different directions or, you know, whatever America's population, 300 and whatever million, uh, we're in all those different directions. That's, that's disorder. That's not unity. Uh, the same thing is true in our families. The same thing is true in our church that um, we have to evaluate our motives. When we're doing something, we have to say, hey, is this just me being selfish? I know that, uh, you know, for me, uh, in, in our marriage, like there'll be things that I want. And if I don't get my way, like most of us, I, you know, I kind of get uh, upset or hurt or whatever. And, and uh, but over time, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit is changing my heart to, to help me to step back and say like, hey, is the problem here that I just didn't get my way? Um, because if, if, uh, if, if my wife Katrina wants one thing and I want something else, why should my way uh, be greater than her way? And so, you know, God's beginning to shape and to change and to transform the way that I think about it um, to say like, hey, if I'm upset just because I selfishly wanted what I wanted, that's not a problem with her. That's a problem with me. And uh, so, so we have to look at our motivations. We have to, we have to ask ourselves, hey, w- w- what's going on here? Motivation uh, is really important because if you're not motivated by the right things, if you're not built on that foundation, it doesn't matter what you build on top of it. And this is a good moment for me to just share, friends, that uh, if you're listening to this message, and you um, uh, you're like, oh yeah, I gotta start, I gotta start taming my tongue. I gotta have the right motivations. I got, you know, I got And we're about to come up on a list of a bunch of characteristics. And there's this temptation to say, well, okay, I'm just gonna check off all those boxes, and then I will be wise, and then I'll be in the right place. And I just want to encourage you that the foundation that you have to build it on is by beginning that understanding that you, that you're dead in your sins, that you've been separated from God uh, by disobedience. And that there's no amount of good works that you can do to make yourself into a good person to be acceptable by God. And so it begins, the ultimate motivation and the foundation comes through the gospel, the good news of Jesus that says that when we were separated from God because of our sin and unable to rescue ourselves, that Jesus came and gave his life so we could be forgiven. And he gave his life so that his perfect spotless record could be applied to us. And so when God looks at me, he doesn't see all my sins and failures and, and shortcomings, but he sees the perfect obedience of Jesus placed upon me. And and at the cross, Jesus took all my sin, all my brokenness, and he took it upon himself and he paid the penalty for it. He took the punishment I deserved and he gave me the reward that he deserved. That's the ultimate baseline. That's the ultimate motivation for anything that we do. And a wise person will begin with that motivation. And see what that does, what that unlocks is it says, well, hey, listen, if if I was a broken sinner in need of salvation, that I'm not rungs above, I'm not steps above that person. That person is, is in the same boat as me. We're in, the, we're in this together, right? We're all people who are sinful by nature, who are separated from God and who need a savior. And so I, I can be kind, I can be compassionate, I can be empathetic towards someone else because they're really no different than I am. I'm no better than anyone else. It, it, if we really get that gospel truth into our heart, it changes our motivation and our motivation will be to honor the Lord. This provides a good transition point into uh, the next uh, statement. Um, A wise person, number three, a wise person displays wisdom in their character. Uh, They they display wisdom in the way that they do things. Uh, Because here's the reality, uh, good motivations are essential, they're important, Um, but simply having good intentions but not following it up with the right actions uh, there, there's a saying, it's not in the Bible, right? This is not scripture, but this is a, a saying, right? That uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? That sometimes people say, well, hey, I want, the, I want an end goal that's good, and so I can go by any path or means necessary to get there. And a wise person understands that how you get to the goal in mind is just as important as the goal that you get to. You have to have the right motivation. You have to be aiming at the right target, but the way that you get there matters. Your character matters. And James continues to unfold this um, at the end of chapter 3. So picking up in James chapter 3, verse 17, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, I love those verses uh, in discipleship this week we were talking about. Man, that is, a, that is a verse to just meditate on. There's so much richness in there. There's so much uh, to pull out of there. And, and here's how I want you to look at it and think about it. Obviously, we're looking at our own lives and saying, hey, if, if I claim to be wise, if I claim to, to want to live in a godly, a wise way, 
Do, do these words describe the way that I am living my life? Do they describe the way that I'm going about pursuing the things uh, that I want? I would also encourage you to think about the people that you emulate, the people that you look up to. You know, whether if you're a business person and you look at someone and say, man, I'd, I'd love to have the success and I'd love to have the, their business, their business is doing exactly what I want to do. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that person, look at their character, look at how they got to where they got. Uh, because they might have the results you want, but they might have got there in a way that you would never want to emulate. And if you're not careful, you'll say, well, hey, if I want their results, I have to follow their path. And wisdom would tell you that there is a different way to go about it. The same is true uh, as I look around at other churches and what other churches are doing, and I look at other Christian leaders and, and teachers and preachers, uh, I might look at them and, and admire them and admire uh, the influence that they have, but I also have to look at their character and how they built to the place where they're at. And if and if they didn't do it in these ways, then that's not somebody that I should emulate. Uh, the same thing is true for, for whoever you are, wherever you're at in life, the, the people that you follow on Instagram or Facebook, uh, the way that people get to the goal is just as important as the, as the goal that they're getting to. And so let's take a look at a few of these things. Pure, right? Which one of these stands out to you today? Pure, peaceable, gentle, not exerting their will and, and forcing things on people, but, but, but gentle, using their strength with wisdom, right? That open to reason, not just hard-lined and, and bullheaded and I don't even care what you have to say because I already know where we're going, but they're open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. You know, the, the, the fruit that's coming out the end of it is good, right? That, that they're impartial, they're not biased, they're not slanted, right? I, I can promise you right now, if you jump on any of these cable news channels, if that's your main source of information every day that you're feeding into your mind, right? Whether it's, whether it's Fox News, whether it's CNN, whether it's MSNBC, whether it's any of these things, right? That, that there is a, there's not an impartiality, right? That there's a bias that's implicit in, in those things. And um, man, it, you can begin to imbibe that into yourself. You gotta be careful of that, right? Sincere. Not just saying what you know people want to hear, not just, not just flattering people, uh, not doing things deceptively, but, but being genuinely who you are. And, and I think that's a huge piece of this. Um, if your character is developing in this way uh, and your motivations are right, guess what gets a lot easier? The whole taming of the tongue thing. That becomes a lot easier if you are one person, if your inner life matches your outer life. Uh, because because when when you when you have all these things inside that that are broken and, and you're like man I got to filter that I can't let that come out I got to be careful in this company I can say this but over here I can't say this and I got to make sure that that person doesn't hear what I said to that person man that's just a recipe for it's not going to be long before your tongue gets you into trouble but but if you are sincere if you are genuine if you are gentle if you are, if you're impartial if that's your nature and your character then you don't have to worry so much about the filter on your mouth because because what's inside, if it comes out, is not going to harm you. And you're going to say the same thing to this person that you would say to this person. Uh, the, the, that So much of the Christian life of, of being shaped into the image of Christ in both our personal, private life and our public life, that it's one person, that we're not different people in different places, but that we are the same in every sphere of our life. Man, that's the goal. That's part of a discipleship. That's what we're becoming. And I'm not there yet. I'm sure you're not there yet. But that's the process that Jesus is taking us on. And then the result, he says that, I love this, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, praise God for that. That's, that's, that's what we want, right? Don't we want a harvest of righteousness? And if we want a harvest of righteousness, if that's what we want our life, man, at my funeral, I hope that whoever preaches my funeral gets up and, and says, you know, hey, there is a harvest of righteousness that came out of this man's life, um, but it has to be sown in peace by peacemakers. Uh, it, it's it's not sown in, in division and, and and hatred and disunity and uh, all these disorder. That's not how we get to the place that we want to go. That's that's what wisdom looks like. Uh, we're going to jump over now into First Peter three, and a lot of these same things are picked up there. And so we kind of paired these passages together. But if if you jump over to First Peter uh, chapter three verse eight. Uh, we're going to see more of this idea of, of a wise person displaying wisdom in their character, right? And so in 1 Peter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So again, it's, it's, it's that, you know, if, if you're following Jesus, there is a character expectation. That's what this whole series has been about, uh, that, that when you're following Jesus, it should be reflected in your character. That's the natural result of it. And, and I love this unity, right? That, that we're unified. Man, that's, that's what we want. 
you have sympathy that you, you care for others you uh, you you have sympathy and empathy you can you can look at the lives of others and you care you genuinely care for other people you have brotherly love you know brothers will fight bro brothers will disagree but ultimately there's that kinship that pulls them together and that um, that a brother would 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 give his brother the shirt off his back right that that, that, that we care for one another uh, even if we if we have minor disagreements there's still a deeper foundation of love a tender heart not a hardened heart not a bitter heart not a cynical heart, right? But, but, but a tender heart and a humble mind. It's amazing that uh, Peter's writing this, um, you know, hundreds of years after the prophet Micah, and yet there's a reinforcement of these same things, right? And this, out of Micah, Micah 6, 8, we got the series title, Justice, Kindness, and Humility. And we see these same things here. Um, humility is so underrated. And I know I've talked about this throughout this series, but humility is so significant. It's such a significant quality. And, and I would just ask you today, you know, would people say, hey, that, that is a humble person? Or are you always self-promoting? Are, are you prideful? Jesus wants to, to shape you more into his image. There was not a more humble man than Jesus, and that's something that I think that we all need to emulate. The fourth characteristic and final characteristic that we're going to look at today, you know, number one, a wise person will seek to tame their tongue. Uh, number two, that a wise person is motivated by the right things. The third one is that a, a wise person's character will, will be a reflection of their wisdom, that, that how we get their matters, right? And the fourth thing is that a wise person will experience God's blessing. And so in two different passages in back-to-back -back weeks, we have this idea that, hey, if you, if you do this, you will be blessed. And um, man, this can be, as I mentioned last week, this, this can be an uncomfortable thing because we're, we're, so, uh, uh, we're so averse to the sort of the health and wealth prosperity gospel that says God exists uh, to give you the desires of your heart, uh, which is false, which is, which is untrue. But the reality is, is that God does desire to bless those who walk in his ways. If you're walking along the path of life, you're walking along the path of wisdom that he has laid out, the result is going to be blessing. And isn't that what we really want in our lives? I'm glad that we can biblically embrace God's blessing, but it looks a little bit different than we might expect. And so let's look what he says, uh, picking up in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, uh, but on the contrary, bless, for this to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But... Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Man, so much powerful truth packed in there, uh, really around this idea of blessing. And I just want to point out a couple of things that he says here. Uh, the first, you know, one of the big motivations here is that essentially if you're walking in the path of wisdom, if you're doing what's right, God is for you, and so who could be against you, right? But, but if you are walking opposed to God, if you're not walking in wisdom, it says that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Man, I don't know about you, but I, I, want, I want to be aligned with God. I don't want to be in opposition to God uh, because uh, that is a path to destruction, right? Uh, and so, so for a very simple thing, walking in wisdom aligns you with God, which is, which is so important. The second thing that he says that is so powerful, I love this in, in verse uh, 13, he says, now who's going to harm you if you're zealous for what's good? If you're doing good, who can harm you? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. What he's saying is that when we walk on the path of wisdom, we're in a win-win situation, right? We will experience earthly blessings of God pouring his blessing out on us. We'll experience blessing here and now. But even if we suffer persecution, even if we, we suffer uh, slander or reviling, because of doing the right things, that we will be blessed. We'll, we'll, we'll be storing up treasure in heaven. And so we, as, as a Christian, if you walk in the paths of wisdom, you can't lose. 
you'll either receive a, a blessing here and now or you'll receive a blessing into the future. But, but essentially, he cautions uh, this, this simple thing that we keep coming back to, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, that, that don't repay reviling with reviling because then you've lost your standing, then you've lost your ground. But if you, if you do what's right, even in the face of evil, even in the face of slander, even in the face of someone who's treating you horribly, if you continue to just do right, it will only fall back on them. I mean, this is what we see, right, in our political divisions in our country, right, that, that both political parties are, are filled with some pretty significant flaws. And so neither one really has a moral high ground at this point. And so it's not like uh, certain people can be like, hey, well, those guys, look what they're doing. They're horrible. We, on the other hand, are spotless, right? Um, the, the, everybody in the world of politics seems to have their hands dirty. And so there is, there, there's no moral uprightness. Uh, I had this discussion, you know, and, and, I've, and I've sat and talked with people who are in really, really difficult situations where they've been really hurt or harmed by someone that they loved and trusted. And my encouragement to them is always the same. Don't let their sin lead you into sin. Don't, don't, don't let their sin become an excuse for you to, to say, well, hey, they did it. I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to fight fire with fire. Or I'm, you know, if, if they're going to do what they want, fine, I'm going to do what I want. At that point, you lose all standing. It, it basically, uh, but, but if you'll persevere, continue to do what you know is right, uh, continue to do what honors and glorifies God, you can trust that, that the righteous judge will ultimately bring all things to light. Whether it's here in this life or whether it's in the, in, in the hereafter, right? we know that God sees all and he knows all. And so uh, if you've been sinned against, if you're being sinned against right now, I want to encourage you, uh, don't let it turn your heart to wickedness. Don't let it turn your heart towards sin. Stay the course. Do what is wise. It doesn't mean you have to, to continue to take it if someone is being abusive or, or hurtful to you. It's, a, it's proper and it's right and it's good to put up boundaries, to set limits. Sometimes that's the way we love is, is to, to, to do it. We talked about this, uh, you know, it says, bless those that revile you. Well, that doesn't mean reward them. It doesn't mean just accept them. It means to love them, to bless them. And some, sometimes the way that we bless them is by saying, hey, you, I see you walk over a lot of people and I know you're trying to walk over me and I love you. I, I want to see that change. And so I'm out of love for you. I'm putting up a boundary because you can't treat people this way. And, and I, my hope is that this, this will be uh, the beginning of, of a change in your heart uh, because I want to see you end up in a better place and I ultimately want to see our relationship restored, right? And so, so blessing doesn't just mean letting people walk all over you. Sometimes blessing is to, is to put down a, a firm boundary. There's a lot of wisdom that's required in that, and that's really what we're talking about here, right? The last thing I want to talk about is this, that, that he says, hey, uh, when you go through a trial, when you suffer for righteousness, and, and, and people see that, they're going to notice. And so he said, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have in you. Be prepared when that moment comes and somebody says, man, how are you enduring that? Um, our natural inclination is just to be like, oh, it was nothing. Uh, yeah, you know, well, you know, my parents raised me right, or oh, you'd do the same thing, or you know, all these sort of cliche things that we throw out there. No, no, that's a that's a ripe opportunity when someone says, how can you endure through this? What you're doing? It's like, man, you know what? In my own strength, I would never be able to do it. Um, but but I'm motivated by the gospel. I see what Jesus has done for me, and that's what he says down in verse 18, right? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. You see, Jesus suffered for me, and I was unrighteous. That person who's hurting me, they're acting in an unrighteous way right now. But guess what? I, I've had unrighteousness in my own life. Um, and, and Jesus was willing to suffer righteously for my unrighteousness. And so if he did that for me, I, I can endure some suffering for the sake of righteousness that, 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 because Jesus has freed me. I live under the law of liberty, right? That my hope is in my relationship with Jesus, not in the, in the things of this earth, right? And so, so think about that. He says, be prepared. That doesn't mean just, man, hope you say the right words, the right thing. And I know there's the passage where it says, hey, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit, and then that's definitely true. And you should pray, say one of those prayers in that moment of, Lord, help me to say the right thing. But, but being prepared means like, hey, as I go through this, people are going to want to know what, what's going on. And, and I need to be able to share. I need to be looking for opportunities. When somebody asks me about my life, I need to use that as an opportunity to point them to Jesus. And if you do that, that is the ultimate display of wisdom because there's no one wiser than Jesus. There's no path worth following that, that is anywhere close to the path of Jesus. That when we walk the path of Jesus, then the path of Jesus led to the cross. If we're following his path in wisdom, 
we should expect to, to experience some trouble. He said, if they, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. We don't want it. We don't desire it. We're not looking for it. We want the blessings. We like that part of the passage, right? But, but we should understand that the path of wisdom doesn't always mean the path of ease and comfort. But it's the path that Jesus walked and it's the right path. And so I just want to encourage you today. Man, evaluating your own life. Am I walking in wisdom? If not, Lord, show me where, where I need to walk in greater wisdom. Convict me of areas where I'm, I'm acting selfishly out of selfish ambition or jealousy. Uh, Lord, convict me if I'm emulating or, or seeking to, to, to be like someone who's not walking in true wisdom. Um, and, and we need to pray for, for a greater level of wisdom in the church, in our, in our, in our nation's leaders, in, a, in the world. Uh, godly wisdom is, is an incredible blessing uh, to, to everyone, and we need to pursue it. Join me in prayer. Father God, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, these words of encouragement and strength. I pray that we would, we've looked here into the mirror of, of who we truly are, who we're meant to be, who you're shaping us to be. And I pray that when we walk away from this today, that we won't forget what it is that you're doing in us. I pray that, um, that you'll convict in our hearts and draw us more and more into your character, that, that as you change our character, uh, as you change our, our motivations, that it will become easier to tame our tongues, uh, that we'll do all of this with wisdom and we'll use our words to bless and to build up. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thanks so much uh, for being a part of, of the, the message today. Uh, I pray, uh, and I would ask you to share with someone. Man, if you want to forward the sermon on to somebody, that's great. But, but I would encourage you even more powerful is to, to get into a conversation with somebody, maybe around the Thanksgiving dinner uh, this week. You know, they say, hey, what are you thankful for? Man, that's a wide open door to be prepared to share the reason for the hope that you have in the midst of the 2020 train wreck that we're in. Uh, that we still have hope and God may open a door at a, at a gathering this week for you to share that. And man, I want you to be prepared and I want you to be bold when that moment comes. May God bless you until we see each other again.